Hello, I'm Ms. Clark, the senior high school counselor at Clyde Savannah High School, and I'm here to take you through the Financial Aid 101 presentation. If you have any questions, feel free to contact me at the phone number and email on the screen. The cost of attendance for college includes tuition and fees and room and board. These are the direct costs that will be on your bill. And this includes the cost to register for all of the courses that they're gonna take. It may include living in a dorm room or a meal plan and, and or any off-campus rent, groceries, utilities, et cetera. The estimated indirect costs are also included in the cost of attendance for college. And these include books and supplies, which a student will purchase on their own, personal expenses like doing their laundry, paying phone bills, and they estimate every year a certain amount that the average student at their university spends on fun, miscellaneous items, et cetera. Transportation will also be included in these estimated costs of attendance, and it will depend on how close you are going to home if they decide to include airfare for people traveling out of state or far away, um, or they might include gas, tolls, and regular fares for, or regular costs for commuters. So you can expect to see the tuition and fees and room and board on your bill, but your financial aid package will also include these other estimated costs that the average student spends every year. Your financial aid package for your child will include all costs. So the total cost of attendance, which is all of those items I showed on the, on the page before, minus what they determine is the estimated family contribution. And we'll talk a little bit about how they determine that. Um, this is a calculation of financial need. It's based on the family's income in their house and also the size of their family. They also take into account if you have more than one child in college at the same time. Um, this number is determined by the federal government and it's the same for all schools that you apply to. It is supposed to represent the amount that you can expect to pay. So what the colleges will do is they will receive a report from the federal government that includes your estimated family contribution and they will subtract that from the amount that they have determined is their total cost of attendance which includes the tuition and fees, the room and board, as well as those estimated indirect costs like books, personal expenses, and transportation. And after they calculate that, they will use that to calculate your financial need. And this is the amount of grants, scholarships, work study, or loans that will be required for you to cost to cover all the costs of your attendance. There are four ways to cover a student's financial need. 70% of all financial aid comes from the federal government, and this is in the form of grants, work study, and federal student loans. There's also scholarships. These can be merit or performance-based or need-based, and they can come directly from the school or from other programs and opportunities that you find within your community, or from, sometimes they come from brands and, and many different organizations that wanna help students go to college. So grants are need-based and they do not need to be paid back. I call this free money. Um, there's, you get these from the federal government or the state government. There's the Pell Grant, which is based on only on financial need. Academic grades and extracurriculars are not a factor. The maximum award for the 2021-2022 academic year was $6,495. There's also the Federal Supplemental Educational Opportunity Grant, and those awards can range from $100 to $4,000 a year, depending on the amount of other aid you receive and the availability of grant funds at the school you're attending. Those both come from the federal government and they are purely based on financial need. There's also New York State's Tuition Assistance Program or the TAP Award. This award can be up to $5,165 a year and is also based solely on financial need. Scholarships, which is also free money that do not need to be paid back, they can be based on a variety of criteria. 
So there's opportunities for everyone. And I recommend that you start searching as soon as possible. Um, there are a lot of different kinds of scholarships. There are some out there that are heavily marketed that are very easy to apply for. They might be as simple as snapping a picture of something or answering a very simple question. Um, there's also, you know, the old joke is that there's a scholarship for people with a left hand. That is true. Um, and that is the only requirement. So there's many, many, many opportunities out there. There's a scholarship for everybody, but it is important to keep in mind that those that are heavily marketed and the easiest to apply for will likely have more applicants than local opportunities that have more requirements to be eligible. So it's important that students maximize their time by organizing by deadline and by considering carefully which scholarships are worth applying for and where they wanna dedicate their time. They should also try to reuse their work as much as possible. If you apply to one scholarship, there's a good chance that parts of your essay can be um, modified to fit the, the criteria for another scholarship. So that's, that's a good way to just save all your work, save some of your best stuff from high school, and you might have something that you can use for a scholarship and that'll save you some time. Um, it's important when you think about all the work that's involved in applying for scholarships, it's important to remember that for every $1,000 in scholarships you get of free money, that's five months of student loans that you will not have to pay back. So therefore writing an essay may be worth your time as long as you feel like you have a good chance at the scholarship. The best way to find scholarships is to ask around. Let as many people as you can know that you're looking for scholarships. There are many local opportunities that might be specific to your neighborhood, background, or through affiliations with churches, labor unions, professional organizations, and associations. And also regularly check in with me and listen to the announcements all year long as I'll be posting scholarship opportunities as they come my way. Here's a few resources for searching for scholarships. Um, definitely, you wanna create an account on Dollars for Scholars in order to be eligible for the scholarships that are local. Um, you also wanna sign up to get updates from New York State's Excelsior Scholarship Program, which may cost cover the costs of SUNY or CUNY tuition after federal grants and TAP awards are applied. Eligibility is based on income and residency alone. So if you sign up, you can get all the updates when they come in from the state and you'll know exactly what you need to do to apply. The College Board, which many of you may have an account with already, if you signed up for the SATs or if you were using their college search service, they also offer a scholarship search service. So this is a great tool to find scholarships and other financial aid and internships for more than 2,200 programs it, the amount of money that they claim to have in their database is worth $6 billion. Um, one of the great things they have that is very easy to do and is probably one of the few easy opportunities I recommend doing is their opportunity scholarship. Basically you earn entries in a raffle every time you complete a step in your college application process. And this gives you a chance to win financial awards. So since you're gonna be doing this work anyway, through the process, it doesn't hurt to sign up for it and enter your name in the drawing. Um, you may also create an account with Scholar Snap, which is connected to the college board and it will auto-populate scholarship applications for you. This is fairly new, I haven't used it much yet. So if anybody tries it out, please let me know how it's going. Um, Scholar Search is also a mobile app that lets you customize your search and ranks opportunities by how well you match to them. And then there's a list of four more useful websites. You may want to check them out before you um, create your account and enter all of your information. Do a quick search of their list of scholarships and see if you see several that are relevant to you before you sign up and give them all your information, because they will probably market you heavily with many scholarships and you don't want to be cluttering your inbox with opportunities that are not available, not relevant to you. Work study is something that you will apply for on your financial aid forms. I recommend that everybody say yes at this stage to work study. What it is, is it's a job that you get on campus that fulfills some of your financial need. 
It keeps cash in your pocket without interfering with your studies because you have the job right on campus. Many of the jobs are designed to be just a few hours, a couple of days a week in order to put some cash in your pocket and connect you to a relevant department in your school. It encourages community service and work related to your studies and provides job experiences and references for future employment. Working in an office on your campus is a great way to be in the know about various scholarships and opportunities that mostly spread around through word of mouth. Um, work study is something that's available to undergraduate, graduate, and professional students with financial need. It's purely based on financial need and it's available to full-time or part-time students. Even if you commute, you don't have to live on campus to have a work study job, um, but it would also connect you to the campus well if you are commuting. So it's something I recommend doing. You can say yes right now on your financial aid application. And then when you get your aid package, you have the opportunity then to accept or decline a work study opportunity. And then when you go to school in the fall of your freshman year of college, that's when you would go out and find the job. So you, after you get, even if you accept work study as part of your financial aid package, you do still need to go to um, the employment office on your campus and find the job your first week of school in order to get started. And that's the best way to, to get going, have some cash in your pocket and have access to some of the best opportunities on campus. Federal loans will cover your remaining costs, but it is important to know that you will have to pay them back. There are different types of federal student loans available and it's based on financial need. Most do not need to be pay month, repaid until six to nine months after you graduate college. So the most common types of student loans that you will see in your financial aid packages are the Perkins and the subsidized loans. So these are need-based loans that do not accrue interest until they leave college. The Perkins loan gives you nine months after graduating before you have to start paying it back. And the subsidized loan has to be paid back starting six months after you graduate. But both loans do not accrue interest while you're in college. The unsubsidized student loan will also likely be on your financial aid package. And these loans are made eligible to any undergraduate student, re regardless of financial need. And as a result, they do accrue interest during college. So you will have to be mindful when you get your financial aid package back, what percentage of, of your loans are subsidized versus unsubsidized. And you can actually take advantage of an opportunity to pay some of that interest as you're going uh, in order to help you uh, get a little head start on paying some of this back. You'll get, for the unsubsidized loans, you will get a little bill every year that will show you how much interest has accrued and provide you with the opportunity to pay it off. You do not have to pay it if you do not have the money until after you graduate, but if you have a little bit of cash from a part-time job or something else while you're in college, this could help save you a few months of payments at the end of your, of your time paying back student loans. The last kind of loan is a direct plus loan. These are loans that are made to parents and repayment begins while the student is attending college. So in the financial aid package, after they apply all of the grants and all of the awards and all of the scholarships, they will fill in the rest with loans. And if that still doesn't cover the cost of attending the college, they will include the direct plus parent loan. It is possible to help to get help paying back your loans after college. So what my goal for you is to not have any debt going to college, but if you will have debt, which most people will have some debt, we're gonna keep it as low as possible. However, if you do graduate college with student loans, it is not the end of the world. There are other ways to get help finding a way to pay them back. There are student loan forgiveness programs for working in public service jobs or high need fields and locations. It is important that you read all the terms carefully when you sign your loan notes and make sure they're the kind of loans that will get forgiven if you're eligible for these programs. Also, professional organizations and community organizations may offer student loan relief rewards to recruit young professionals. This is a way that they, you know, encourage people to join their organization and get involved in advancing their profession. So, 
that's also a possibility. And it's very good to join professional organizations um, at any point in, in any career. Uh, remember that student loan interest payments are tax deductible. So you'll have the opportunity every year when you do your taxes to claim the interest um, that, has a, that you have paid off as a way of reducing your total overall income on your taxes. So how do you get all of this money? To get the most financial aid, you need to fill out every application every single year that you are in college. So the first, your first step is to fill out the free application for federal student aid, otherwise known as the FAFSA. This is how you will get the federal grants like the Pell Grant. This is also how you will get work study jobs and the subsidized and unsubsidized federal loans. That's always your first step. It's very important to do it every year and you wanna make sure everything on that document matches your parents' taxes for the previous year. Your second step is to do the New York State Tuition Assistance Program application. So that is required to be eligible for all of the state grants, awards, and scholarships. That is how you will get your TAP award. That's how you'll get your Excelsior scholarship and anything else that comes from the state. There are opportunities with the state based on going into certain fields like STEM fields um, as one of the examples and anything from that, you will have to complete this application as well. The best thing to do is immediately upon finishing your FAFSA, click on the link to the state application as it will automatically populate the application for you. And that will allow you to get it done even more quickly all in one setting and you'll have the two applications done. There's a third application for some private schools. It's the College Scholarship Sur Service CSS Profile. So if you think you're applying to a school that may have this profile required, come see me, we'll check the list, or you can check with the admissions office at the colleges that you're applying to. There are mostly private schools, and this is a form that is very similar to the FAFSA and just asks some additional detailed questions to get a better sense of your family's financial picture. The FAFSA becomes available every year on October 1st. To complete the FAFSA, you will need the student and the parent's social security number or alien registration number if they're not a US citizen, student and parent's most recent federal income tax returns and other records of earnings. Now it is possible to transfer your federal tax return information directly into the FAFSA using the IRS data retrieval tool. And I've found that if you wait a few weeks after the application has become available and start a little bit later in October, you have a better chance of that tool working the way you would like it to. Um, student and parent FSA IDs are required to sign electronically. When you start the FAFSA, it will prompt you to get your FSA ID and both the student and the parent need separate FSA IDs, which are linked to separate email addresses and it goes based on social security number. The FSA ID that you create tied to your social security number, as well as the one that your parent creates tied to your parent's social security number, will be the FSA ID that you will use the entire time you are in college and if you return to graduate school many years later. So it is very important that you keep your logins, passwords, IDs, and information somewhere safe where you'll remember and be able to recall them easily. Another thing about the FSA ID that is important is there is only one per social security number. So that means if your parent already created one for an older sibling, they need to locate and use the same one again for your application. You may also fill out the FAFSA using a mobile app called My Student Aid. I get a lot of questions about which parent's income has to be reported on the FAFSA. If you have any questions or think that you might be able to be independent of your parents for this process, please come see me at any time. In general, it is always gonna be the custodial parents or mostly both uh, that are required to fill out the FAFSA. This chart demonstrates a few of the possible scenarios. I know there's also many more scenarios if you have a question at any time call me.
To complete the TAP application, which also becomes available every year on October 1st, you will need to complete your FAFSA first. New York State verifies the information on your TAP application against the FAFSA. So by indicating on your FAFSA that you are a New York State resident and selecting a school in New York State, you are able to transfer all of your information from the FAFSA to the TAP application easily and automatically. You will also need your most recent New York State income tax return. Oftentimes I've seen people transfer their data from the FAFSA and everything populates correctly. And really the only item they need to adjust is the income because oftentimes our adjusted gross income for our state taxes is slightly different than what it is for our federal taxes. You're going to also both the student and the parents will need a separate HESC PIN to sign into their TAP application. And when you go to that application website directly from the FAFSA, you will be prompted to create this PIN. So that's a step that will come to you naturally. But if you have the question, the answer is yes, you do need to have a separate PIN for this application as well. If you do not have a chance to do your TAP application immediately when you complete your FAFSA, you may be required to wait a few days for your FAFSA to be processed and sent to New York State. That's okay, you can always go back and fill out your TAP application later. Just don't forget to do it because it's most important for state schools. Your timeline for senior year is starting October 1st, you're gonna to wanna to create your FSA ID for both the student and the parent, and you're gonna to wanna to fill out your FAFSA and TAP applications. You also want to start the process of determining if you must complete that extra CSS profile for private colleges. And it's a good time to begin looking for scholarships and start noting the deadlines and requirements if you haven't done so already. I suggest that everybody make a list of all the scholarships they're interested in applying for and the deadlines. And if you miss a deadline, keep it on your list, check out if they offer it to, if they offer a scholarship to college students as well, and remember, hold on to your list and remember and apply the following year. You're going to want to finish your college applications by the deadlines, which is usually January. Um, the only exceptions are colleges with rolling admissions, which means that they accept applications throughout the year on an ongoing basis in preparation for each semester. So you could apply to those colleges all the way up through August when they start their fall semester. Um, the, and, so you have to check with the admissions office to find out if they have rolling admissions or if they have a deadline. You're also going to want to pay attention if you're interested in applying early action or early decision to colleges. Um, you have to know all the terms and details of what you're applying for and what the deadlines are. But for the majority of you, you're gonna finish your college applications by the deadlines that are usually in January. And then you will receive your financial aid award letters in March. So you'll get the acceptance letter that'll include the package that'll outline all the details of the cost of attending college and as well as any grants, scholarships, awards, and loans that, are you gonna, that you're gonna get in your financial aid package. Some scholarships may be referred to in your acceptance letters, but it's, you're not seeing your full financial aid package unless they are showing the total cost of attendance minus your estimated family contribution and demonstrating your full financial need is covered by a combination of scholarships, loans, grants, et cetera. The best way to stay up to date on your responsibilities is by checking your email and logging into the college's website where you applied. Colleges may ask you to fill out additional forms or verify information before they give you your financial aid package. Checking your email is the best way to know if they're gonna require something additional from you or if they have any questions or if they haven't received anything on time. Use the email address that you check most. Do not use your school email address if that is not the one that you check most. And also it's probably a good idea to use a personal email address so that you can get messages after you graduate. We still have spots in the College Bound program. If you want to meet one-on-one -on -one with an advisor on Mondays during school to stay on track, you can, you can sign up with me. It's a good way to have dedicated support. Another opportunity is I will be holding office hours at the beginning of November for people to come in and finish their financial aid and college applications. <laughs>